Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Hey, so Dr. Paul Mason, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning, Doug. Hey, man. So yeah, we, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Paul Mason coming out to our event finally in August this year, uh, so the 15th to the 18th of August. Paul, it's been a long time coming. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. And first of all, I really, really appreciate your invitation to come to one of your Low Carb USA conferences. As you know, back in uh, you know four or five years ago, I was planning to come and that got completely nixed uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, it's been a long time coming, getting back. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm really stoked for it. It's, uh, it's coming up in just a couple of months. Yeah, no, I'm very excited. And we were talking... Yesterday, I think about um, a couple of different talks that you possibly were going to do. And one of the things we were talking about doing is maybe having a Q&A session at some stage where people can ask you all sorts of things. So I was hoping here to, to kick that off um, by starting with a, with a question right here. And then that was about blood tests. People really don't know there's two things. First of all, what blood tests should they even get? And then how, how do we actually interpret them? So I was wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, to be fair, I mean, this is what my day is all day, every day is all about result interpretation. And it's one of the biggest problems that we actually face in medicine, because the very, the concept of having biomarkers that reflect our health is a very good one. So we tend to use the, these blood markers as biomarkers for, you know, are we healthy? Are we not healthy? Are we going to have heart disease, so on and so forth? The trouble is some of them are more reliable than others and sometimes the reference intervals are completely out of whack. So you're familiar when you go to a doctor, right, Doug, you, you get a sheet of blood tests and they've got the values down one side and then they've got what's called the reference interval on the other side, which is the range of acceptable blood values. You're familiar with that? You've got that in the I States, have, yeah, I yeah, imagine? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now, here's a question for you. Do you know how that reference interval range is actually set? I have no idea, but I would love to hear. Well, that's it. But if we talk about how it's used, like we know how most doctors use it. Most doctors use it as a guideline for acceptable or even healthy blood results. If your results fall within that reference interval, the interpretation of most doctors is that, hey, you're fine. You're in perfect health. Nothing to see here. Move along. And the reality couldn't be any different because most of the reference intervals are actually based on population averages. You've heard of something called the confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval. So basically what a 95% confidence interval is, we, we have a range of data and we take the middle 95%. We exclude the top 2.5%, we drop off the bottom 2.5% and voila. We've got all this data in the middle. So basically, if, we're, if we pick a value, like, I don't know, a, a nutrition marker or something like that, for you to fall outside the range, you know, to be on the low end of the range, you basically have to be in the bottom 2.5% of the population before you're considered to have an abnormally low level. Now, here's the question is 95% of the population healthy? No, do I have to answer that? Well, I mean, <laughs> or 97.5. Or I mean, the thing is, what is normal as far as a population goes mm -hmm. is not healthy. They are not the same. So we really should be setting these reference intervals for targeting health not targeting normality. In today's society, normality is not something to be aspired to. So we can give you several examples. So we'll take vitamin B12. Now, this is really topical because it's the, uh, uh, you know, it's a supplement that vegans and vegetarians love to take. And I, I was actually very interested the other day because I uh, occasionally we have patients who can't absorb B12. Um, they have conditions like atrophic gastritis or pernicious anemia. And I was looking for some suitable supplements, methylated B12 supplements that I could recommend. And it is almost impossible 
to find a methylated B12 supplement that is not a vegan supplement. And when I say a vegan supplement, we're, we're, the capsule can be made of plant products or it can be made of animal products. And it seems to be that so many, uh, which is good in a way, so many vegans are taking B12 that they're all labeled as vegan friendly because they know where their market is. It's vegetarians mm. and vegans. It's not exclusively vegetarians and vegans. You have other people who have malabsorption issues and it doesn't matter how much they're, you know, they're taking, there's always going to be a bit of a deficit of absorption. And sometimes you try and supersaturate those or you, you inject with them, but that's beside the point. The point is B12 levels are really commonly tested on blood tests. In Australia, our reference interval, now I, I deal with labs from all over Australia, but a, a common reference interval will have the acceptable lower level being 135. Uh, and it usually has a range going up to 650. And then in subtext, underneath this, I'll have a little, uh, a little disclaimer basically saying any v B12 levels less than 400 are considered to be low or at least equivocal. So I show that to my patients because it's on the form that I, I copy in my patients to all their results. So they get this and they usually don't read that little disclaimer paragraph at the bottom. When they read that, they're confused. They're saying, well, hang on. My B12 is, you know, let's say 200. It's in the reference interval. It's well over 135. And then I've got this paragraph down the bottom saying that it could be considered to be low. And they're like, well, why do they even do that? And that's the whole point. The reference intervals are not reflective of optimal healthy levels. Mm. And you can apply that across most facets of blood tests that the, if we actually have a look at the levels that are associated with longevity, people living the longest, then the, where the value should be is a lot tighter and a lot more controlled sometime than what the standard reference interval is. Occasionally, the optimal level falls outside the recommended reference interval completely. So it's, I find that when I'm interpreting blood tests, I really have to consciously interpret it based on what the literature shows and not what is just written on that sheet for convenience. How would you suggest that they, that they set the, the, those actual values? Where, how, how would you, I mean, this, you've described how they actually do it. How yeah. would you do it if, you, if it was up to you? Well, we often have literature. So one, my favorite outcome in science is mortality. And that's because you can't fudge it. So in terms of clinical outcomes, nothing beats living. If you're still alive, that's better. If you're not alive, if you've died, then that's of it. And you can't fake that. You, you can't have a mischievous researcher come through and uh, manipulate the methodology too much when you've got mortality as an outcome. Mm. So I like to go to all-cause mortality data. Uh, and we've actually got troves of it. Now, a lot of it that I, that I go to actually was developed in the 1960s and the 1970s from a lot of insurance companies, because at one point in time, insurance companies were very scientific about how they actually set their, their levels. And to a degree, a lot of them still are, but some of them have sort of lost the plot a little bit with, with cholesterol. But in general, the insurance company research that was done in the 60s and 70s is absolute a, a treasure trove of valid information as to what levels we should aspire to. You know, we might say for folate, for example, the level of folate that is acceptable is considered down to seven in Australian units, whereas the level that's optimal for mortality is probably going to be closer to 40. There's a, you know, a, a world a of difference, difference between the two. That's so huge. What, one, what's barely acceptable for survival in no way uh, ensures that you've got optimal longevity. And the simple fact is that a lot of my patients, we could probably put them in the biohacker class. They're looking for optimal health. They're looking for maximum longevity. So I, I, that's, that's the, probably the, my preferred method of setting these reference intervals is having a look at what levels actually associate with the best health in the literature. And that is very, very different from what levels are just spread in the population. Now, not every reference interval is set based on 
population averages. If we take LDL, for example, low density lipoprotein, then basically we're on a race to the bottom with that. So when I was in medical school, and that was you know, some time ago, even then they were still talking about this new goal for cholesterol being called as low as it goes, meaning that we don't have a target for your cholesterol. The goal is to just drive it down as low as we possibly can drive it down, as low as it goes, which is complete and utter nonsense. Now, in that context, we still actually do have thresholds for LDL that have continuously and progressively been dropped over time. And the only purpose that that served has really been to increase the proportion of the population who can justifiably be medicated with these cholesterol-lowering medications like statins and now the new PCSK9 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the research demonstrates that the people who take statins whose cholesterol actually lowers the most actually have the worst survival. No, they have the highest mortality rate, right? They have the highest yeah. mortality. I mean, that's the same thing. And, but that really makes a mockery of this, you know, tendency to keep driving either the cholesterol threshold down as low as possible. And basically it, it has been assessed, I think, since the 1970s, this continual decline in target for cholesterol has seen the potential market for statins increase by something like six times. Mm -hmm. So people who were once considered to be perfectly healthy are now considered, oh, your cholesterol's high, you, you need to take this drug. From a marketing perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. But there's another whole class of biomarkers, which I think is very poorly interpreted, and we call them antibodies. So the job of your immune system is to protect you from foreign infection, from pathogens, virus, bacteria, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And one of the major ways your immune system does that with the generation of little proteins called antibodies. These antibodies are like guided missiles that are particular for one foreign pathogen. And when they, each, each pathogen basically has a barcode on it. We call it a glycoprotein. That's a particular molecular sequence that is recognized by an antibody and says, hey, I know you, you're not from these parts, I'm gonna get rid of you. That's all well and good. But occasionally, or well, increasingly commonly, we have antibodies, we generate antibodies that can attack your own tissues. It's a case of mistaken identity. You have a, a, an element of the immune system that's gone rogue. And let's say, for example, one of the most common immune conditions is against the thyroid, what we call Hashimoto's disease. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's hard to explain how common this is, except if you understand that this will eventually destroy the thyroid gland and lead to an inability to secrete sufficient amounts of thyroid hormone and understand that levothyroxine is the second most commonly prescribed drug in America. So, you know, you, you've got all your statins and antidepressants and reflux medications and blood pressure medications. You've got, you know, huge amounts of drugs and thyroid hormone is number two in the list. So this is a very, very common condition. So, and it's increasingly common, for which we won't go into right now. But basically your immune system can produce these antibodies that through a case of mistaken identity will start to attack you by mistake. Hmm. Now, the two common antibodies that we use to assess whether you've got thyroid disease or Hashimoto's disease is thyroglobulin antibody and thyroid peroxidase antibody. And these are both involved in the, the, the formation of thyroid hormone and the function of the thyroid gland itself. Now, here's the thing. If you have something with the potential to attack your own body, what is a desirable level of that antibody? Something that's going to prevent that, right? Well, let, let's look at it another way. Okay. If, if you walk out your front door and you're going to be mugged, you know, you, you, know you, you might, you know, how many muggers would you like to have attacking you? <laughs> Zero. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but because these autoimmune diseases with these antibodies are so common and increasingly common, we have thresholds, diagnostic thresholds set for the antibodies. We say, well, you can have antibodies up to this point. You know, so rheumatoid factor is commonly set at 20. If you've got 21, then you've got, you're sorry, that's not good news. Right. But if you've got 19, you're fine. 
Now, I don't think people realise how completely arbitrary this is. We, we, we put it into a dichotomous, we create it as a dichotomous variable. It's either good or it's bad. And it's nothing of the sort. If you've got antibodies that can attack your immune system, it's absolutely on a continuum. The more you have, the worse it is. And the, the best outcome is going to be to have zero. But the, the way reference intervals work is they don't account for that. So I see lots of people, they, uh, you know, as a sports medicine physician, and I, I see a lot of people with joint pains so on and so forth, and they might have a rheumatoid factor that might be 16. It doesn't meet the diagnostic threshold, which would be consistent with the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, but it sure heck ain't normal. And almost certainly it's going to be contributing to their symptoms of aching stiff fingers when they're waking up in the morning, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, so, it's like that with, with diabetes as well. I mean, what in, in US units, it's like 6.5 is, is, is the threshold. You, it, it, it comes back at 6.5, you've got diabetes. But if well, it's 6.4, so it, it, about... 6 then, then you're to totally healthy. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. And that's the arbitrary nature of the reference interval basically converts uh, or, or leads to our interpretation of these continuous variables as dichotomous variables. We're talking about, you know, is the switch on or off? Is it black or white? Are you good or are you bad? Mm -hmm. And we, we lose flavour. We lose nuance and understanding of exactly what those values actually mean. Yeah. So in terms of blood tests, if you were going to say when, when you send people for, for a blood panel, what, what do you ask for? So first of all, every blood panel I do is actually personalized to their history. Okay. So, and there's, I, I'm starting to write a, uh, a protocol uh, just to try and, because it is absolutely vast. So I had last patient I had last evening, uh, had restless legs. Now, restless legs can be a symptom of iron deficiency. So this patient absolutely has to have their iron values tested. A lot of people would, would not understand this. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of doctors don't have visibility that, uh, you know, that, that iron deficiency can also cause cramps and cardiac palpitations. So if you've got certain symptoms that is possibly caused by, you know, a nutrient deficiency or an inflammation or something like that, I will absolutely test that. But let's take something like, iron, this, it becomes a very complex process, but it's, it's a process that, that is not impossible to figure out. So there's a concept of something called nutritional immunity. And this is a fabulous, fabulous concept. It was first developed in 1975. And this just spoke to the point that most pathogens that can infect us actually require iron, most if not all. So we're unfortunately a smorgasbord of circulating iron in our blood for pathogens that might want to invade our body. So our immune systems have developed a mechanism by which when we get an inflammatory signal or an inflammatory trigger, we actually remove the free iron from our blood and put it into storage, into something called ferritin. And we've actually shown that if you inject an inflammatory marker, something called lipopolysaccharide, which comes from bacteria, if you inject that into people, then within two hours, you can have a greater than 50% drop in the amount of free iron in their blood. So this is really important. But where's that iron go? It gets put into storage. It gets put into something called ferritin stores. It, it's like in a silo, but just because you've got the iron in that silo doesn't mean you can use it. That's the mm. whole point. It's put into that silo to make it inaccessible to whatever pathogen that might be infecting you. So when a doctor is actually measuring your iron levels, what do we measure? What, what do we use as an assessment for do you, what, whether you've got sufficient iron or not, we measure the ferritin. The ferritin level. Okay. And, and there's no visibility to whether or not you can actually access that ferritin or not. If you don't have, if you've got bugger all ferritin to begin with, then we know you're going to be deficient in iron. That's what we call an absolute iron deficiency. But if you have a very high level of ferritin, 
Mm. It might mean that your stores are wonderful and you can access it, but it might also mean that you're in a very inflammatory state and every bit of free iron that you've got is being shoved into the ferritin and you've got what we call a functional iron deficiency. And this is the very point of what we call nutritional immunity. When you have a lot of inflammation, especially persistent inflammation or chronic inflammation, then you can end up with very, very high stores of ferritin, but it's effectively a state of iron deficiency. So we know that iron deficiency can cause something called anemia. Well, so we've got what we call iron deficiency anemia. We also have something called anemia of chronic inflammation that looks almost identical to the anemia of iron deficiency. And the reason is because they're effectively the same. So if I'm measuring somebody, you know, you've got uh, cramping, cardiac palpitations, restless legs, I want to see if you're deficient in iron, then I measure your ferritin. Now, if you've got a very high ferritin, does that automatically tell me that you don't have a functional iron deficiency? No, I need to do wider evaluations and then I need to see if you've got inf an inflammatory state. Now, there's two markers that we commonly use as inflammatory markers. One's called ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate and the other one's called C-reactive protein or CRP. Mm -hmm. And both those are still imperfect markers. They, they don't assess inflammation from every angle. But fortunately, we've got numerous other, other markers. We call them uh, acute phase reactants. And an acute phase reactant is basically a protein that in an inflamed state, your liver can make more of. So, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that the process of what markers I, I use on a patient, it, it's not a simple one size fits all equation. It, it is variable and it is complex and it really depends on the presenting symptoms that somebody presents with. But there's a few things that are really, really common. Um, so everybody who goes to any doctor will usually have what's called a full blood count and they'll usually have what's called an EUC, electrolytes, urea, and creatinine. This is, the, the full blood count gives you an idea of uh, all the red blood cells and white blood cells, how they're going, the sizes and, and the shapes of them. And the, the EUC gives us a bit of biochemistry. It tells us about a lot of different electrolytes, mm -hmm. um, creatinine, urea, chloride, bicarbonate. And we get a lot of useful information from those values. And a lot of you can actually infer a lot of information from those blood tests if you actually use the correct reference interval. So if we'll take something, we'll take a red blood cell. So one of, when we don't just count the number of red blood cells, we actually look at the size of red blood cells. And we look to see whether the red blood cell is too big or the red blood cell is too little. And if you've got certain nutrient deficiencies, B12 or folate deficiency, you can end up with big red blood cells. If you've got an underactive thyroid, you can also end up with big red blood cells. If you've got an iron deficiency, uh, you can have small red blood cells. You might have a genetic condition called thalassemia that will also lead to a small red blood cell. But the trouble is the reference interval for size is usually between a range of 80 to 100. Whereas... The literature would suggest that you don't have to wait until the cell goes over 100 to call it too big. Probably if it's 95 or 96, it's probably already getting too big. So if we just start to interpret that and when we say, okay, I know there's a list of possible conditions that can cause the cells to get too big. You know, do you have a thyroid problem? Do you have B12 deficiency? Do you have folate deficiency? So on and so forth. So we can certainly uh, get some good visibility um, if we're thinking about things a, a little bit more laterally. Mm. Now, for example, I'll just show you how, how in-depth the analysis then can actually get. So if we say, well, possibly you might have a thyroid problem, normally doctors will look at something called thyroid stimulating hormone and will use that as absolute proof that your thyroid activity is adequate, that, it, that it's fine. And the reality is if we look at that TSH in isolation, it doesn't tell the full story. So first of all, there's other markers of an underactive thyroid that are often ignored. So I said to you that the size of the cells, the mean cell volume is an important one, but also mm -hmm. the thyroid gland is actually anabolic, meaning it supports, it builds muscle. So people with a dysfunctional thyroid gland often get muscle 
damage and destruction that we can have visibility of through a marker called creatine kinase. This is an enzyme that's found inside muscle cells. And if the muscle cells are bursting open and being injured, they'll leak that into the blood. Mm -hmm. So whenever I see somebody with an elevated uh, creatine kinase, I always wonder, Ooh, could they possibly have a thyroid issue? And this is even if you've got a normal TSH level, you still might be having some other symptoms of an underactive thyroid. Now, one of the problems with thyroid is that we secrete this hormone uh, and it's secreted as T4, but that's inactive. It has to be activated to T3 version. And some people you know, will have a problem with activating T4 to T3. Now, sometimes we can determine what the problem is. It might be a zinc deficiency. It might be a selenium deficiency. There might be iodine issues or so on and so forth. But occasionally we can't quite figure that out. And, but either way, let's assume that somebody has got a problem converting their T4 into active T3. So they end up with a deficiency of active thyroid hormone. However, the T4 is still able to exert feedback onto the part of the gland, the anterior pituitary gland that secretes the thyroid stimulating hormone TSH. And it basically brings the TSH into a normal level. It makes it look as though you've got enough thyroid hormone. But in actual fact, because you're not able to activate the T4 to T3, you actually have a deficiency. So the, the problems are numerous. There's a lot of pitfalls when you're interpreting blood tests. And all too well, unfortunately, in medical school, we don't get taught a lot of the nuance and the subtlety mm. that we really need to correctly interpret a blood test and evaluate a blood test. But if you do look at a blood test through a scientific lens, then even a basic standard full blood count and EUC, you can, you can certainly get a lot of useful information. It's all about the clarity of interpretation. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I was expecting you to start talking about lipids and LDL and blood, small, dense and large, fluffy and all of that stuff. Well, but, here's it. Why, why don't we say <laughs> that for the Q&A at the conference? Yeah, so. exactly. Well, but that's, but that's like a standard answer. Where you, you gave like a whole, a whole different view of this whole thing, well, which, here's is, the which thing. is brilliant. Do you know what an underactive thyroid does? It also can elevate your triglyceride levels and your cholesterol levels. Yeah, so there we go. If that, if, and so, if those are high, it could be that, that this is causing it, right? So, exactly, yeah. exactly. So if somebody, and I just, you know, it, it's all too common, elevated cholesterol. I saw somebody with this exact presentation yesterday. So elevated creatine kinase and uh, your elevated cholesterol. And it was an underactive thyroid gland that was causing it. Was causing it. Wow. So, I mean, you, and it's just, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it, it does require a methodology. You mm -hmm. need to be systematic and quite meticulous about how you go through things. Oh, that's brilliant. So I know you got, you got to, you got to rush off here um, in a minute. So, the whole idea of this was just to whet people's appetites here. This is what they can maybe look forward to um, if they come to the event and and come and join our Q and A and and hear you wax lyrical about all these different things. So I'm really really looking forward to meeting you again since we saw you in uh, in uh, last Sydney, October Sydney in October, right? At that yes. like down under. So it's going to be brilliant. I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks very much well, for thank taking. You taking the time of your busy morning to, uh, to do this well, with us. I'm super excited. And uh, again, thank you so much for, uh, I know you've got a really busy schedule with the conference and I appreciate that you're allowing me to squeeze a couple of extras couple into of the extras program. And, yeah, and I will find a way for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Much appreciated. Hey, thanks, man. Hey there. And say hi to Finn. Hey, Finn. And, and, oh, and Zoe, it's about time for me to take these kids to school. Hey, Zoe and Finn. I'll see you, Finn, in, in San Diego next month. Uh, yes, Finn's next coming to San Diego. Oh, cool. Brilliant. We'll see you there, Finn. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you, Doug. Okay, Looking bye. forward to seeing you soon. Cheers, Finn. Bye. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash USA.